This is Peter Helland and Gus Zilke on the show Israel. And we're going to call this part two of the last show, um, Journey Through Boomer Years. Uh, part of the reason I have Gus on is the scripture says by two or three witnesses, something, uh, everything can be verified and proven. And the scripture or church teaching is that you don't have to believe what somebody says to you if they claim they have a private revelation, especially. Um, you're not obligated. And even St. Paul, when he would preach the gospel, it says the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they didn't believe Paul. You know, it's kind of a contradiction here. I mean, yeah, you, you, you know, you're supposed to believe somebody, but the scripture says, nah, you're not supposed to believe them. You're supposed to prove it. Okay. So the Bereans did not believe Paul until they confirmed it. And I guess Gus is here partly to confirm some of the things um, that happened. Now, we started out with um, the Book of Wisdom. Uh, no, we started out with Sirach talking about wisdom. That uh, 38, it says, you cannot become wise unless you have leisure, mm -hmm. okay? And the wise man pursues the wisdom of God and he pursues knowing the ancient writings, okay? And I have known Gus since the 70s and a theme that Gus goes by is the importance of uh, intentional community, uh, living in a culture where communities are falling apart. Okay, so intentional community and at the basis of intentional community is uh, contemplation mm -hmm. and um, leisure playing a very important role in that, mm -hmm. okay? So you definitely understand Sirach saying, without leisure, you cannot become wise, okay? So journey through boomer years, we're trying to see, okay, what is my journey? Where do you, where do you see it? And what you didn't know about me was, uh, after I dropped out of Notre Dame in 74, you're six years behind me, um, dropped out in 73 and then I ended up and I was majoring in psychology and it just so happened I ended up seeing a psychologist and that was because my dad made me because he was so upset and I in order for me to live out the farm and to pay rent the rent was I had to see a psychiatrist and he was Jewish from Poland and he had the training similar to me behaviorism uh, with, with psychoanalysis, like a Freudian take. And so when I said to him I was thinking about God, he, after about four months, completely reversed himself. And he said, I fear you're having a fantasy, you're entering into psychosis, and we're going to have to put you on medication, or if that doesn't work, you're going to have to go to the mental hospital. Okay, now I don't have a witness to that. Unless he's alive and he'd admit it. Uh, he called my parents in. He didn't tell them why, but he said I was really falling back, just the opposite of what he had been saying. And because of prayer, and I, I, finally, I found a prayer group, and they, because of prayer support, probably, I was able to easily free myself from that. Not everybody can free themselves from it. Not everybody in the Soviet Union uh, could free themselves from it. And we just did the show uh, on Joe McCarthy. Uh, so we're very familiar with what happened in the Soviet Union. That people would, if they manifested any belief in God, they were shipped off to a mental institution to correct their problem because they were having a fantasy and they were into psychosis. Now, make a comment on that. You know that to be true. So I want to, you know, what's your understanding of that phenomena? And then we didn't think that would happen here. But it almost did in your case. Yeah, and I can't be the only case. And, and uh, that was something we thought only happened in the Soviet Union. And I, and I even said it, it could have happened in the millions. Because the Soviet Union, Russia, was, was very Christian. 
for almost all its history, and all of a sudden they have to be suddenly all atheist. That's quite a shift. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, this, this uh, it's like a great divorce during modern times between the healing of the psyche uh, by secular means and the uh, relationship with God and faith. And there's this, there's this division uh, that has occurred where uh, uh, people, some people who engage in psychology reject uh, any norms of, communal norms of faith, be they uh, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, well, whatever. And, and, and so you got a problem uh, of uh, where they can't interpret the code. They well, can't, that, that I think is what's going on. Well, I, somebody gave a comment, you know, that the uh, Solzhenitsyn's book, The 200 Years, mm -hmm. is, is still not in English. And then somebody put a, a site up, you, you, can, you can actually see his whole book online in English. Oh, really? Yeah. And what was Solzhenitsyn saying, basically, describing the Soviet Union? Well, it was pretty horrendous. Uh, yeah, I didn't read that book, so I wouldn't know. Yeah, but you know a little history of what Solzhenitsyn has well, been well, saying during his whole career. Right, I do know that. And, and yeah, it was pretty, I mean, the uh, secularization of, of the culture under communism was pretty thorough. In other words, the removal of any notion of God completely removed out of the culture. Right, they tried. Yeah, and, and, and they, they couldn't because as drunk as the Russians got, they still uh, made it. Well, yeah, and one of the things I was taught when I was at Notre Dame is that when they were, the, the government would put up the icons in the museums and then they would get embarrassed because the elderly ladies would walk through the museums blessing themselves on the icons like the Orthodox Russians do. They'd walk up to the icon. In fact, when I was in Russia uh, in the 90s after communism, and uh, of course I went there with my father and my wife, and uh, we adopted two children from Russia. Um, but, but when I was there, I, uh, I was at the uh, the center of Moscow, the Kremlin, that area there, and there were two chapels. And I walked into one of the chapels, and I saw this lady. She must have been 90 years old, and she had gnarled hands from all her work, and, and she was blessing herself on one of the icons. And I felt the Lord say to me, he spoke to my heart, uh, he said, Behold the hands that fell the even evil empire. Behold the hands that took down the evil empire. I realized it was the prayer of those elderly widows in uh, Russia. But, but here, here's my point. What is your point? My point is this. That was imposed from top down. Okay. okay and, I, and I've probably given the story in the show where I met this uh, girl on the South Shore. She was from, from Georgia or Belarus, I can't remember. And she was here to study under the number one pianist in the world at IUSB because they had no money. So they paid him enough money and he came here and worked here at the, at the college. And so she came here to study. So I'm with her on the whole trip from Chicago. And, you know, a real pretty young girl. And she gave me the story. I said, what was it like under communism? And she gave me an example. Her room was right next to her grandmother's room. And her grandmother said she was an atheist. But every night she could hear her grandmother pray. And she would just pester her grandmother, say, grandmother, you say you're an atheist. I always hear you pray at night. And the grandmother, I'm an atheist. OK. Now, why did she do that? Because they had to officially say that. Now, here in America, the devil has used a whole different technique to achieve the same results. He has, he has done it from within, deep into our brain at the youngest age. So it's deep within he's creating atheism. 
So you have people that might be the head of the University of Chicago's divinity program, and they're atheist. Okay, so you have atheists running the, the, the theology departments. How about how about the uh, the situation at Harvard? Well, that was mentioned. Uh, there was a, a a chaplain at Harvard who was an atheist or something like well, that. Well, here at Notre Dame, you have uh, Father Burchill, who denied the res. He's the head of the theology for years denied the atonement and the resurrection. Right here. Then he gets caught sleeping with the students, so they had to fire him. Okay? So, the, the, by, that psych, by me being thrust with this psychiatrist, when I said I was simply believing in God, and boom, I have to go to the mental hospital and put on medication. Well, you're thinking, well, that can't happen here then why did it happen? It shows you that the internal corruption, trying to force everybody to be separated from God, which is what the enemy's always trying to do at every level possible to separate you from your pursuit of God. Either become, you become a workaholic, okay, you become so onto the serving mammon and the love of money track that God is always secondary in your life. And the traps here in America are, are so many, people can't even figure it out. That's why you started, you belong to an intentional community where there's a focus on strengthening the family, mm -hmm. okay, on purpose. And I've been talking about that a lot um, I wouldn't mind talking about that a little bit um, because we grew up, I think you've mentioned that your mom had Dr. Spock's book there at the table, at her bedside table. My mom, same age as your mom basically, had the same book, Dr. Spock. And so there was a different way of raising kids, according to Spock, right? Spock was bringing a different method of how to raise your kids. And how would you describe that? Well, for my mom, it was, it was a, a, some kind of combination of Dr. Spock and Catholic natural law. Well, I'm law. just saying, I'm saying I, in, light, in light of how yeah, it was traditional, she, what did Spock change? What was, if you, can you highlight some of the, you know, regardless of how your mom interpreted it, how was Spock seen as changing how kids were raised? What, what were the fundamental differences? Well, it, it was more lenient than previous years. What do you mean lenient by that? Lenient that, that they weren't, uh, uh, it, it, it wasn't as strict as the previous generation. Um, it relied more on certain psychological techniques of control, I think rather than uh, just the uh, uh, fear of authority. Okay, so, okay. So. I would say that that, that might be the, uh, the, one of the key things. Again, I... Uh, so authoritarianism is, became the enemy after World War II, right? That's, what, that's what I've been told. In fact, even the most conservative people out there still use the word authoritarianism as an evil word. Well, political authoritarianism has some problems connected to it. So well, yeah. Well, hold it here. Uh, but, but behind that word is a hate, is a is a is a rejection of accepting authority. That's obviously what the word means. So how else would anybody understand the word? He's an authoritarian. Oh, so I mean somebody who believes there's authority somewhere. Yeah, well, you, you can get imbalanced in your appraisal of these things and, and throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, but, but, but and I think after World War II, a lot of people did. I think that's true. Well, first of all, my understanding of the family, and that was the whole purpose of intentional communities, which were happening, which you, and you joined one of the intentional communities that was developing around the country was to re-establish the family where it ought to be, re-establish the husband-wife relationship where it ought to be, right. 
and reestablish the, you know, the children, you know, th those relationships, reestablish them back on a Christian foundation. Yeah, d there's a lot of disorder in relationships. Uh, and so to reorder relationships. So, and I, of course, I see that that's connected to a proper kind of ordered liberty, like uh, we should have in the in the political realm too. But but it's interesting that the intentional community that you joined mm -hmm. in the mid '70s is almost a result of the the the, the um, collapse of community and family that had been going on in the in the wider culture. There was a lot of different pressures placed on uh, normal uh, human life by technology, by uh, uh, the, the, the shift in the economy, I'd say, um, by, uh, and by the, the uh, secularization of culture. The, the, uh, I mean, we, I mean, you've, you've done a lot of discussion on that, uh, especially on the sexual revolution and so on. So all this is happening, and it's sort of a question of what, what shall we do as Christians to address that? Um, well, the, the, you, have to, you have to whittle away, what, like we were saying before, when we grew up, all you had was CBS, ABC, and NBC. That's what everybody had access to, mm -hmm. and almost that's all you had access to for news on the national level. Now you have millions of videos, either on YouTube or BitChute or all these other ones, and everybody can pour, pour out their worldview and what they think is the most important thing you need to know to function. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you have a million choices and you used to have just a couple. Right. Okay. And, and it's the explosion of choice in the modern postmodern world. Right. So now you got to runs take, us into trouble. You have to take all this and all, unless you're successful at boiling down what are the essentials. Right. That if you lose focus of intense concentration on these essentials, your house is going to collapse. Okay. It's like Lombardi on the fundamentals. You have to locate. What are the essentials? Well, obviously, you've located one. You have to have a community, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to have intentional community if the other communities are falling apart. Right. Okay? But a community is generally consists of married people and single people. That's correct. Okay? And since we don't have the monastic life, so to speak, in this country, in any comparison how they used to, Five right. monasteries to every county in Europe, you know, it used to be before America. So you could, uh, your chances of, of living in a monastery are slim, even if you wanted to. Right. So family is where you have to start. Okay. So we are, we're assuming that the family is totally disordered. Okay. It's disordered at every point. And that's the problem. People think there's some area where it's not disordered. No, it's disordered everywhere. Okay, because what creates a family? What creates a family? Yeah. A marriage. Yeah. yeah. So, so in the Bible, you have Rebecca meeting Isaac, right? Right. It's kind of like the ideal model because you don't see, you don't, the Bible doesn't talk about when Sarah met Abraham. Okay, they were half, that was his half sister. Okay. And Rebecca was related to Isaac too because they went back to get a relative. Okay. But we're not looking to the scripture very well to, to order our family because it's all about the beginning. It's all about the initial beginning of the creation of the family. Okay. That, which is the crucial point. Super crucial. In other, word, in other words, the example would be Everybody knows, because I substitute taught for eight years, that if you don't get control of that class, uh, you may never get it back. You have to immediately get control. So like the teacher's first week, like a regular teacher, you know, the first week is crucial. 
And if you lose control that first week, you may never get it back. Now you taught for a year, okay, mm. and you know. I know. You know, okay. That's probably one reason why you only taught one year. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, here's my point. Here's uh, Abraham's servant. Okay, Sarah dies. And Abraham goes, my son now needs a wife. Because his mom is gone, he needs a wife. So he tells his servant, go back to our hometown, go back, you know, where we're from, and find a wife for, for Isaac. Okay, so the servant goes way back, you know, where they were originally from, because he wanted to get somebody of his own. And he picks up Rebecca. She was probably 14. Isaac is 40. Okay. That's probably how you ought to do marriages, but we don't. Okay. Mary was 14. Isaac, Joseph very well could have been 40. Okay. People say they go by the Bible, but they don't. Okay. So here's Rebecca, and here's Isaac. And Rebecca comes and sees Isaac contemplating in the field. That's pretty important to know that. And when she sees him, she immediately curtsies or bows, calls him master, and boom, the relationship is locked in right there. It's locked in. And if you don't lock that relationship that she calls you master and she fears you and she's looking up, if you don't lock that in and keep it, it's over. It's over. It's going to become a joke like it is. Okay, so the way we start a family, look at how we start them. I'm just saying, look at how we start them. They date, they become friends, they're equals. They're equals through the dating process. If anything, the guy is fawning on her and bowing to her. And then they get married, and then they're, gonna, they're all of a sudden going to transform from friends to, to the Isaac and Rebecca relationship. You think they're going to? No, they're well, going to stay friends. They're never, they're never going to transform themselves to, to Isaac and Rebecca, where Rebecca calls you know, Isaac Lord and Master like, her, like Sarah did. That's what Isaac would have expected. Isaac grew up with a mom, Sarah, who called, called Abraham Lord and obeyed him. What do you think he expected of his 14-year-old wife? Okay, this is the foundation of community. It's how... Rebecca communes with Isaac. It's how that relationship must lock in to a biblical pattern. And when you don't lock it into a biblical pattern, it's, it's the basis of everything. You won't, you won't go anywhere. Because now you're against God at, at the key point. You're disobeying God at the key point. Now, what, how are you disobeying God? God says how a marriage ought to be running. God says you need, a wife has to be a daughter of Sarah. The man must make sure that she is obeying, obeying Abraham, calling him Lord. If you're not a daughter of Sarah, you're not a Christian. And the husband has to lock that in. We are not doing that. Not at all. We don't think it's important. And now we're seeing, you know, 3% of the girls are virgins when they get married. Less than that, probably. But that's about norm. Are we leading the world in divorces? Are we leading the world in obesity? I mean, yeah. America's a great nation because we're the leader in a lot of these categories, I guess. Okay. Now, what's the root cause of why, how did we get here? Now, as, you know, we're, we're journeying through the boomer years. What do we, you know, are we making any good corrections? Or are we just going with the evil flow? Well, I think people can make good corrections, and I, I don't know that uh, your uh, account of the cultural norms of uh, Rebecca and Isaac are, uh, are, are necessarily uh, constitutive of every relationship. Well, I mean, I mean, that's, that's that, Old Testament. That's what I mean. Peter, and, Peter in the New Testament says that the women are to imitate Sarah, who right. called Abraham Lord, and up till the Civil War, they did call him Lord. And they all wore the covering on the head. And when the kids are born into the world, what do they see? They see their mom calling their dad Lord, 
obeying him as unto Christ. And they start going, I guess I think I know what I'm supposed to do. But if they see their mom, who's their role model, playing equal with the dad, calling him honey or Bill, not master, being maybe more the boss than he is in the home, it's internally wreaking havoc on their soul because it's going completely against how God says it ought to be. So is it any wonder that one-third of these kids out here, uh, millennials, uh, identify as LGBTQ? Did you say one-third? That was the Arizona study. And from 18 to 24, they say 39% identify as LGBTQ. I'm not saying it's, it's true. I'm just reading that study, but and people can just observe. So this has got to be coming from the, the total perversion at the, at the core of the husband-wife relationship, and it manifests in these children. So how did we get from Dr. Spock in the 50s making it more lenient? Where is this taking us? Well, I, I don't they know. didn't even have time out with Dr. Spock. We, that came later. Right. Yeah, so it became much more lenient. I mean, you're the expert. You've joined a community that focuses on running the family how it ought to be. I mean, that's your whole focus. The family ought to be run exactly how, as the church has always taught. Right. I mean, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, you have to slavishly obey these uh, cultural norms that came from a different era. Yeah. Don't we have scriptural norms that are clear as day? Well, the, the scriptural norms need to be translated by the church. And the church... Well, no, the church fathers have already done it. We don't need any change. Well... There's, there's not much... No, things don't change. Isn't, isn't that what Bosway said? Uh, uh, well, Bishop Bosway? Nothing changes. We well, don't need the church to uh, redeclare what the church fathers have already declared. Catholic means universal, right? And it means, what did they always teach on this matter? The wife's now supposed to be in charge? Oh, development of doctrine, so now the wife's in charge. That can't happen. It is happening, but it really can't. So in other words, in other words the, how the church has taught the family ought to run doesn't change, does it? It doesn't change in its... Uh, moral orientation, but it can certainly change according to certain cultural norms that aren't um, governed by morality. They're just well put it put it this way. They're they're just uh, uh, accidental. They they just happen in a certain culture a certain way. Put it put it this way. Okay. In the South, in the before the Civil War, they were pretty pretty adamant that. There is no, the children belong to the parents. It's the parents who are obligated to so-called educate them. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're not allowed to pass them off to a church school. You're not allowed to pass them off to a government school. They basically didn't allow it as far as their teaching. Why? Because that's your job, the parents. You are to teach them. And that's and, still true. The right. parents are the primary And educators. the wife is commanded by Scripture to be a keeper at home. Okay? <laughs> and, and unfortunately, that has to be. Because the success of the children are depending on the, the, the you know, quality of the mother's nurturing. She, the Bible commands them to be keepers at home. But we live in a culture where people send them to school. So instead of fearing their mom and dad, the children now are learning to fear the educational people. And then instead of learning to fear their mom and dad, which they're commanded, then after that they fear their boss. They don't fear their husband. The wife is not, the father doesn't pass the daughter off, off to a husband. He passes her off to the school. She fears them. And then he passes her off to a job. Now she fears her boss. This is so far off the biblical, po I mean it's so far off it's gone. We just think it's normal. Yeah, it's normal that 3% of the girls are, uh, are virgins when they get married. It's normal that half the people get divorced. It's normal that people are 
half the people are super obese. That's normal for Americans. It's not normal for Christianity. It's not normal for Scripture, for the church, or any of it. We've just come to accept it. And it goes back to the father and the mother not making sure. No, the, the fear those children have is to them. It's not to the teacher. It's not to their boss. That daughter fears her dad, and then she fears her husband. That's it. Oh, no, she's supposed to fear her boss. She's supposed to fear her teacher. This is going nowhere. It's creating disorder, and it's wreaking havoc on the family structure. That's what I see. And so is it going to take radical Christianity to, uh, to correct it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In other words, being a Christian requires some uh, countercultural work. And you may get persecuted, and it may be hard. But if you're not willing to do it, you're just going to go with the flow then. And where has the flow been taking this culture since the 50s? In other words, your mom was a keeper at home. My mom was a keeper at home. That's all we knew. Probably most everybody in Appleton, and you're younger, most of the mothers were still keepers at home. Right. That's not anymore, is it? No. The economy changed. Oh, the economy? Changed. Or did the fathers in the home change? I mean, the economy forces, uh, really? Is that, is that a good excuse? No. That is a super poor excuse. The economy changed, and therefore the women can't be keepers at home? And that's what, that's what we want to believe oh. as an excuse to justify complete disobedience to those scriptural commands. I mean, do we need to read them? A wife must, uh, what's it say? Let's just read them for our benefit. The older women are to teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, chaste, that means a virgin when they do get married, or when they, you know, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Keepers at home in the Greek is very strong. You have to be keepers at home. In other words, not out getting a job, not owing, not giving your fear to your boss instead of your husband. We've lost it. Don't you think there's a connection between institutionalized schooling and the loss of Christianity in a nation? The parents are the primary educators of their children. But they're not in this country. Well, They're only the primary educators in their, with their children in 5% of the cases. In 95% of the cases, they're not the primary educators. And therefore, you cannot have a Christian country. You will lose it when, when this happens. Because the governments always tend to go evil. And so now who's raising these kids? Evil government institutions. And the parents are giving them over to that. It's been going on for how long? Since the Civil War. Because then they dragged the South all into it. And what's it producing? Crime, you name it. I mean, you said it. When, what, what do you mean I said it? What? That the parents are the primary educators of the children. Well, that's true. Well, are we following that, 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 that truth? Are we walking in that truth as a nation? Are the church, are the Christians walking in that truth? If that's the truth, why do you ship them out to an institutional government school? Or even a church school, who cares? It's the same routine. Do people notice a huge difference whether somebody went to an institutional Christian school or an institutional government school? Do they notice a huge difference? Sometimes, sometimes not. Mostly not. Well, 
Not always. But they, but they do notice a big difference when people homeschool. They do notice that. Okay. Yeah. So why haven't, why have, has everybody rejected homeschool? Homeschooling did not exist up till 1970. Didn't exist, basically. No one ever heard of it. That's true. It wasn't until about 1980 that people started even hearing the word homeschooling. Right. So they weren't even implementing a fundamental Christian truth. I mean, fundamental. Well, there, yeah, of course, I, now, I, now I have a story to tell about you. Uh, you had a friend, I think it's a person uh, in, that you lived with for a time, and he was a student at Notre Dame, and he used to make fun of you, like, relentlessly on your position on homeschooling. What, back in the 80s? Yeah, that would have been in the mid-80s, maybe the late 80s. Yeah, because I wrote a nice big paper on homeschooling in 1987. Okay. Okay, and you were, I, I remember how fierce you were about it then. And this person subjected you to a fair amount of mockery when he was an undergraduate at Notre Dame. But by the time he was married and settled down, you never guessed what he did for the first six grades of his kids' lives. He homeschooled. Him and his wife. The, together, yeah. Yeah. So he was able to. She was able to stay home. Yes. And, and he worked. Right. Yeah. So he had that right. And my point is, is that sometimes he who laughs last laughs best. I mean. And okay. it, and it turned out to be uh, a good move on his part. Oh, I'd I'd say so. Yeah. I'd say so. No. Why do you think homeschooling is superior on principle? than a church school or a government school. Why do you think it could be superior on principle? I think it varies family to family. No, no, on principle. The principle is, you just said, it's the primary duty of the parents to educate their children. So given a choice, if you're going to marry, okay, we're going to start, community starts first where the husband and wife, the group, I mean, the, the man meets the woman. Now, the purpose of marriage is to raise godly offspring. You agree to that, right? Malachi 2, 2, 12? The purpose of marriage is the mutual sanctification of the spouses. That, we all know that, and, but we're talking now about and, the children and education. And, and new, new life children. But, okay? but, but, but it's Malachi, both. Malachi 2, 12 says God is seeking a godly seed. And that's his purpose for bringing them together. It does say that. He has a purpose for bringing a couple together, and the purpose, Malachi says, is because he, God, is seeking a godly seed. That's what education comes in. Now, who's going to produce that godly seed? The government school? The church school? No. The only way you're going to actually have any strong possibility of raising godly children is the parents. So the man will not marry a woman who cannot also be the teacher of the kids. You know, he, you know can you cook? Can you uh, clean the house? And can you teach the kids? Are you going to be able to be a teacher? In other words, they have to fear you. You're their boss. Can you be the boss over these kids and guide that education? He should not marry the girl. Because how is he going to produce godly offspring? Send them to the government school? You're going to, you're going to produce godly offspring sending them to the government school instead of your wife teaching them. They're not even thinking Christian at all, although they think they're Christian. But they're not. It says they confess to know God, but by their actions they deny him. And by you sending your kids to public school, you just denied God. Oh, they don't think so. Well, you could, they can think all they want. But you said it, that, the, the, that it's the obligation, it's the, it's the sole responsibility of the parents. Nobody else's responsibility is it to educate those children but the parents. Yeah, the, but the parents can delegate to different people. To the government school? That's, that's a Christian delegation? It can be. They're going to produce better godly offspring than if they uh, educated them themselves. Uh, different families 
work these things out differently and some do better than others. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make a blanket uh, rule. Well, there it's, isn't one. It's the obligation of the parents to uh, raise godly offspring and to raise them up in the instruction and admonition of the Lord. Uh, I would say it's the obligation of the father to guard the daughter's chastity. He's re the father's responsible that she, when he gives her off to marriage, that she be a virgin. It's his duty. And only 3% of the girls are virgins when they get married. So 97% of the fathers have completely failed on a fundamental duty. How beautiful is that? Now they just won't, they'll say, well, I don't believe it's my duty. Oh, well, what is your duty then? To put food on the table. Is that really it? Have shelter and have food, and then after that, it, they can do what they want. No, something's really gone crazy here. Unless we go back to the very beginning, like Rebecca sees Isaac. She gets on her knees, she bows toward him, calls him master, boom, it's locked in. Now it has to stay that way. That's biblical marriage. When, it, when you lose that, it's no longer biblical marriage. You got a joke now. You got an equal partnership, an American experiment. You have an American experiment. Completely at war with God. Well, I'm just saying, this is what has happened. And we have seen Dr. Spock come into our home. You grew up on it. Our mothers believed in it. And then you have the next generation going even further. To the point, people think communism is almost about to take us over. And what did, what did the boomers, as they call us, do to stop it? They went right along with it. They promoted it. Why? And they're, and they're claiming to be Christian. Why did they go along with it and promote it at the same time they're saying they're Christian? I, that's pretty uh, harsh. Uh, in terms oh, come of on. Don't, don't the millennials, a lot of them, hate boomers? Which yeah. The, yeah. Well, well, do they have a basis? If the boomers failed to do what they were supposed to do, then don't they have a basis of criticism then? Well, every Especially the ones that say they're Christian. The ones that say they're Christian, did they do their duty? If they didn't, don't, don't the millennials have a right to... Uh, Maybe not a spiritual right, because you can't dishonor, but from a certain point of view, aren't their criticisms valid? Well, every generation uh, is comprised of sinners, and there, there are certain kinds of sins that prevail in certain kinds of genera generations. And I would say that the radical secularization of the culture uh, made the boomers were both participants in that and they were victims of it at the same time. Well, let's talk about the fact that government schools are disastrous because you know what happened to me, right? I was substitute teaching. Part of that time I was living at your house. Mm -hmm. So I gave the story on the first part. Can you talk about that and confirm anything? Well, right. I, I, uh, I remember the controversy. I remember how careful you were uh, uh, not to be identified with that particular newspaper that they were uh, distributing. It wasn't. It happened to have an article by you in it, but it, you weren't supportive of the distribution of that paper at Adams. Yeah, because that's the main school I had, and I didn't want to interrupt the ministry that I had going on there. Right. I didn't want to risk it. Right. And I knew kids from Adams and I knew what they said about you. They called you Bible man. And they were kind of, uh, it was affectionate. They enjoyed interacting with Bible man. I mean, it wasn't, uh, it, they didn't, they didn't uh, uh, approach you 
as someone to be persecuted, but somebody to be emulated. But, now, but at least that's the ones but I. It, I didn't to. have to preach the Bible. The, school, no. the schools are so void of any. It's, they're so godless. Just even a, a two second two second glimpse glimpse of a Bible or something. Man, you're the Bible man. I mean, two seconds and you're in, because it's so it's so void. Well, I, I do remember that. I also remember the uh, uh, the controversy beginning um, when people misrepresented your situation. I remember you going looking for recourse, and then I I I was there when you started initiating your famous law case. I mean, even like I went to see Kevin Hassan with the Beckett Fund. Right, you did. And then, you know, trying to, because I had no money. Right, right. You so I had to find some way. Right, you, and you were, uh, you, were, you were seeking out legal help, and finally I found someone who could help you from down south, um, but I made the mistake of misspelling his last name. Right, I was in Atlanta on a uh, business trip, and um, I was yeah. in there for a whole week, and I was going to go and see this guy that you got who was like, almost like number one in the country. One of the best, yeah. Yeah. Because he was recommended to me by someone I knew who was a law professor. Right. And, uh, but unfortunately, his last name was Bird, and I spelled it B-Y-R-D, like Admiral Bird. And I didn't think of questioning it. Right, and it was my mistake. I should have, I should have verified it, and I didn't. And so, uh, and I never forgot that I met the famous Thomist scholar Otto Bird at a Christmas party, and I, I talked with him, and I told him about the case, because Otto Bird spelled his name B Y. B no, oh, B I R D. B -I -R -D. Oh. I said, Professor Bird, I didn't even spell your name right in reference to this legal scholar down in Atlanta. And we laughed about it. But it was no laughing matter for you. It screwed up your case. Well, I did, I did have Notre Dame go to the Seventh Circuit. And I did have a professor there who then had um, a st student whose dad was on the Supreme Court in uh, British Columbia. So we lost in uh, the Seventh Circuit because I knew that I should have done it pro se. I should have done it because I knew it a lot better than he did. And uh, so then we proceeded to the Supreme Court. And by that time, I did get uh, the spelling Wendell right. Bird. I did get him. And he was a, because he had such a great name, it was front headlines for on CNN, oh, several. It was it was a Catholic agent, news agency, but also CNN had it as their number one um, news item for America for for other nations looking at America. High court turns down two First Amendment cases. But had I had Wendell Bird at the Seventh Circuit, then we had one there. They would have had to appeal it to the Supreme Court. Because we had such a good case, yeah. but we're up against a system where the Constitution does not acknowledge God. Okay, so it makes it very hard to argue that I have a right to read the Bible in the classroom, because they're going to say, "Hold it here! You don't have a right to impose your God upon them, the Bible God upon the kids, even by example." That was their argument. Couldn't even read the Bible in front of the kids during a free reading time because that would be imposing, unjustly jamming religion down their throat against their First Amendment rights. If they even saw me read a Bible in the classroom. Now, does this sound like the Soviet Union under Stalin? Of course it does because they were desperate to remove God out of the people and we are just as desperate to remove God. So it wasn't a surprise when I told the psychiatrist, I'm thinking about God, the desperation came. They were desperate to get me out of that school. Why? Because that spirit is running this country.
the same spirit that ran the Soviet Union. That spirit's running this country. Well, what's it say? First Thessalonians. Um, it mentions the Jews, but, you know, it doesn't have to be the Jews, does it? It could be more than just the Jews. But there it mentions the Jews, but in my case, it was the Jewish teacher that, that initiated this, and the psychiatrist was Jewish, but I'm not going to just say it's only the Jews. But it says, the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Well, yeah, the Jews are definitely part of this, but there's a lot more people than just the Jews that are forbidding the Christians from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. The judge, uh, Judge Miller, uh, he wasn't a Jew, 33 degree Mason. That, 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 you know, totally misrepresented the case and, and his judgment was completely a political one. He wasn't Jewish. I'm saying there was all kinds of people involved that were not Jewish. Right. I, I actually think the, the problem isn't one particular religion or not. It's, it's on belief in a person's heart. It, it can manifest itself in Christians or Jews or non-Christians. I mean, it, so, so I, the problem uh, uh, is unbelief. Uh, unbelief that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the king and the ruler of the universe and that he's going to judge us when you die. Unbelief in that. Unbelief in the resurrection, yeah. Yeah, why? Because they love their sin and they don't want to repent of it more than they love God and fear Judgment Day. It's pretty simple. Isn't that what all the church fathers have said it boiled it down to? Some of them did. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. In other words, you don't want to give up your, 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 your drunkenness to come to Christ? No. They want to maintain, want to be a drunk. You don't want to give up your fornication so you can get saved and have eternal life? No, they don't want to give up their fornication. We see that. I mean, you warn people about the, you know, you got to take the, and you say, but it's dangerous to take the, yeah, but I don't want to lose my job. I mean, that's just the physical. They do the same thing on the spiritual. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut the right hand off. Don't be a fool. Better to go to heaven with one hand than to save the hand and, and risk going to hell. I mean, that's at the core of what Jesus was trying to emphasize. This is real. This is, this is you are to have the fear of God regarding your salvation. And you better not let anything, in any way at all, hinder your laying hold on eternal life. In that case, Peter, who can be saved? I mean, that's... Well, what's the number one enemy of, you know, it says the love of money is the root of all evil. Why are people taking the vaccine and not even reading, have you read the ingredients that's in there? No, they don't even know what's in it. They're, they're willing to take such a risk because they don't want to lose their job. And why don't they want to lose their job? Because of the money that they pay them. So the love of money is the root, in the King James it says, of all evil, okay? Where Jesus comes along and says, sorry, either you love one or hate the other, cling to one or despise the other. That's it. Our culture is not walking in that. And many in the church are not walking in that. And when you go to the institutional schools, no matter which one, money is a huge factor. They're like a business. They do not teach love one, hate the other, because they themselves are there to make money. That's another reason why you have to homeschool, to teach the kids. Don't get caught up with people who are living by the love of money, because they're going to suck you in. 
I mean, it is, it, homeschooling is so needed because there's so many things that are a pitfall that only two good Christian parents can do the job of guiding their children through this. The schools are failing. They're failing. They're not, get, they're not making disciples out of these children. Why? They're businesses. They're there to make money. And then if they help the kids, that's good too. But the parents, they're willing to lay down their life for their kids. It's part of their DNA. Right. Yeah. Are the professors at Notre Dame willing to lay down their life? Are the Christian school people working there, are they willing to lay, lay down their life like the parents would be? Usually not. They're there because they're getting paid. They're called hirelings. That's not the best situation. Anyway, so I've been talking on and on here. So um, give me your last comment here. It, it's kind of overwhelming. I, I'd say uh, the lack of uh, asking questions about these things which is what I would have liked to have done, is, uh, uh, is an important thing. We have to be willing to question the uh, uh, first principles of the culture. And, uh, and I guess that's a big part of your journey, is that is, uh, you've spent a lot of time questioning first principles and helping people to see that they might have not looked at the spiritual principles as clearly as they should. And uh, that's a challenge for all of us. We need to contemplate based on our calling to know God. Okay, well, they're telling us to wrap it up. Let's go ahead. Sorry I did all the talking there, but like you said, that's what happened. Um, this is Gus Silke and Peter Helen.